everyone and welcome to the stream. I'm Vikorva, you can call me V, and today I am playing Road Warden. And I'm very excited to return because after, I don't know, 14 hours of playing Road Warden, we finally accomplished something in in this dark fantasy world that was good and worthwhile. And I'm just like so energized and ready to go around and do more amazing things. So hopefully that happens. Uh, hello and welcome to Sambians. <laughs> Lovely to have you here. Sambians is uh, one of my very favorite streamers. Um, so do check him out, check out his stream. Hello, st hello and welcome to Story Dragon for as long as I have you here. And hello to the Ninetale system and to Quarrel. Uh, Quirrell says, having a sick day, watching on the sofa with Fluffle. Oh, hi Fluffle as well! Uh, I'm sorry you're feeling unwell today. I hope it's the kind of mild sort of illness and not like the miserable kind. Uh, wait two days for the lost, ten for the wounded, twenty for the ill and mad, then it's time to grieve. Oof! Doc. <laughs> Fluffle says hello! Yay! <laughs> Sam says, I hope you're well on this fine Wednesday. <laughs> Sam always has the best greetings. Sabira says, if it was a non-miserable kind, you wouldn't be having a sick day. I did worry that was the case. Oh, I'm sorry. May it pass quickly. Good time zone, Rowan. Welcome. All right, back into the game. Okay, so we've traveled back. I think we're in creeks right now. So I probably came here to wash. Yes. I, have, I am two out of five appearance in need of a bath, but that's acceptable. Three out of four armor. My vitality is not great. So what am I doing now? We we ended the plague in Old Pagos, which is absolutely wild, on the advice of the forest speaker, which went so well. Oh, Shoshi, we can do some matchmaking. Yes, it's time for matchmaking. Quarrel says, Buddy's on the sofa too. He's being so snuggly. Oh, Buddy. I return to Shoshi because we've been matchmaking people from the different towns. She's preparing for work but is ready to give you a few moments. I tell her about Marina from Gale Rocks. Well, well, you found quite the someone, friend, and I've heard a lot of good things about her home. But this right talk makes me worried. Are you sure she'd be ready to keep our bonds loose? Seeing your shrug, she sighs. Tell her about me. Don't hide my plans. Just speak of me kindly, she laughs. She wants to have fun with me. I'll make her life warmer. And I love kids. For the first time, her smile becomes humble and kind instead of playful. I try to recall Marina's message. Marina's message does not seem like it will suit Shoshi. I remember it was very religious, but we'll, 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 we'll give it. Then I guess it's not meant to be. She shakes her head with disappointment. I'm glad you opened this chance for me, friend, but there are parts of me I'm not willing to change. Still, I'll make sure the tribe hears about your help. She suddenly raises her axe and shouts, Hey, you! She addresses no one in particular, but her powerful voice makes everyone stop. Strider did me a big favor, eh? Be nice! A few people smile or scoff, and life goes on. That's, that's making sure everyone knows what we did. And if you want to bring Marina my answer, she rests on her, chi her chin on the top of her blade. Tell her... Think it over, for I can make every day of your sweet and light if you're ready to breathe fully. Interesting. Farewell. Shadowfax is lazy looking around as it rests on the dusty path. Okay, cool. I think that went quite well. Now, something we need to do is we have... Um, we could get a pebble for um, a spirit rock for Fot Photius' daughter, Phoebe, but we've been told by the forest speaker that it will make Phoebe unwell, like it could cause her damage, and that we should go talk to the priests instead. So I might do that. I've completed the Swamp Altar quest. Oh, wow. I completed, I look at, look, look at all these completed things. I'm doing so well. Okay. Where am I getting the Empress Cop from? Gale Rocks. I think we're gonna go to the priests from here and see where we go. Sky, hello! Sky says, hey, what game is this? This is Road Warden. It's an illustrated text adventure. It's so, it's a dark fantasy. 
it's very beautiful and descriptive and it gives you lots of opportunities to make friends, although it's hard. <laughs> it's a really, really hard game. Coral says, reminds me of Freefall of QWERTY and Dvorak. QWERTY and Dvorak? That's great. Passing word in the, on in the robot community of how Florence helped. They just yell it. That's lovely. Yes, I really, really recommend Road Warden. I've played 15 hours of it so far, according to Steam. And I'm not done yet. Wait, how long is it till nightfall? 12 hours. We've got plenty of time. Let's see if we can make it to the monastery. Five hours? Alright, I'm gonna ask them about Phoebe. The road is still covered with the pebbler's leftovers, as well as all the leaves and branches on the ground. But at least the beast is nowhere in sight, even though there are some fresh paw prints just nearby. Your plan worked just fine. Oh, we cleared all the fruit away so there wouldn't be a dangerous beast here. Let's hope the locals won't be upset about the wasted fruits. Hit by the cold, howling wind, you adjust your cloak. There's no soul in sight. From the mountain comes the cheerful singing of a woman, though you can't understand a single word. You call the monks by hitting the sticks and the drawbridge lowers. Ailey gestures for you to enter the storage house with his bandaged hand. Warden, he nods, is all all right? His young companion is right next to him, observing your palfrey. Okay, I'm gonna pass on the news and I'm going to ask for help with Phoebe. I bring news from old Pagos, the plague is no more. Ailey flinches as doubt and distrust replace his look of surprise. How? Oh, he's not gonna like this. These right priests are gonna be so mad that I worked with a druid to do this. Uh, I helped an elder druid from Howler's Dell recover his strength. He healed the people of old Pagos and with a bit of luck, the illness won't return. He looks at Decima, not sure how to react but her wide-opened eyes don't help him much. He reaches out to you with an open palm of his bandaged hand. His fingers are flinching. Will you wait here? I'll gather our order. We'd be honored to hear the entire story. For a moment, he sounds exactly like the tribe from Old Pagos. Oh, they're happy. They, they aren't mad about it. Good. Sure, I have time, or you don't need to hear it from me. Go and meet with the villagers. They'll tell you all you need to know. No, oh, sure, I have time. He climbs uphill and enters the cave mouth next to the wooden bridge. His short companion follows your movements like an owl would a snake, blocking your path to the storehouse. You feel the weight of your axe. Soon, new hooded figures gather in the yard. Is it true? You hear a couple of times. When Ailey returns, there's maybe twenty souls around you, sitting on the ground, leaning against the walls, standing upright or wandering around, keenly observing you. The oldest man, wrinkled, blind, and tiny, is sitting on a stool brought by a boy who can't be older than ten. Not all of them wear sandals or carry bags or have their hoods on, but all of them wear similar dark robes. Seems like only the children are allowed to keep hair longer than an inch. In the city harbour, many would take them for refugees. Do I tell them an entire story or do I mention anything outside the knowledge of the people of Old Pagos? I don't want to tell them about Beholder because I know that they are anti-Druid. They think Druids are evil. If they burn Beholder, it would be a terrible thing. Beholder is my zombie tree and I love it. So I won't allow that. I don't mention anything outside the knowledge of the people of Old Pagos, especially when it comes to Beholder. Jabal, hello! They keep interrupting you with questions about the druid, his powers, or your motivations, and while avoiding the pagan altar makes you stumble once or twice, your story goes smoothly. Their doubt turns in doubts turn into warm thanks, despite the few raised eyebrows of the elders. The young boy mentions his sister, but is then reprimanded to forget about his past. Yeah. Finally, Ailey asks the gathering to return to their duties. He gives you a serious look, rubbing the liver spots on his hands. There's what else we need to discuss. Go ahead. I can't believe they're actually talking to me. Like, all of them gathering around to hear my story is such a huge difference from when we first came here. And they just kept such a distance and I wasn't allowed to stay. We only saw two people. Our prelate wants to see, to see ye, thou, thee, he coughs. 
but they're old and feeble and don't speak unless they have to. And only with those who can be trusted. He gives you a telling look. Thou mayest not be a friend of our order, but we hope to find in thee our ally. Okay. I would like to be ally. Ally is almost a synonym for friend. And as we know, I'm here to make friends, so... Uh... I'd be honoured to meet with him, and I'll try my best to gain your trust. He snorts. Thy deeds will speak for thee. Sure? You're not willing to take me to the prelate yet? I thought you just offered that. What? <laughs> uh... I ask him about Phoebe and the spirit rock. Nah, I wouldn't bite into aught touched by that witch. No, okay, your dosha's fine. He hides his bandaged hand behind his back. Why does the father think it may work? You portray the situation as accurately as you can. Ailey gets closer to the cliff, observing the river beneath it, and spending a good few minutes considering the situation. Suddenly, he turns toward you with wide open eyes, making his companion stagger. He's lying to thee, he announces with a great dose of enthusiasm. He seeks no cure for the lack of Numa, but rather for the lack of soul itself. Before ideas calling to greatness, the tribes of the Dragonwoods saw the spell as children. These people are, speak very thickly. As empty shells, throwing them to beasts just as often as they did with the crippled and the short-witted. You seem awful. There's this tale, he glances at you. Thou won't remember it anyway. But the tablets carry no doubt. Tribes shan't hurt those touched with this condition, as there's no such stuff as soulless children. Okay. Well, I, I don't know how I'm, I'm supposed to... I'm supposed to bring this back to... Photius. Uh, but that didn't really, like, give me anything to say, but... What time is it? Six hours before dusk. The plague is gone. Can I spend a night here? New shelter unlocked! Huge. Nine, uh, Quirrell says, I love how this one keeps tripping over the old pronouns. It is very funny. Obviously a, a recent adopter. Shabal says, I got old Pagos done so late in my run that I never got to this bit. I had to immediately run off to redacted location without even going to redacted location first. What? What? Which is a bad plan. You should definitely go to redacted location before redacted location. What? 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 Are they friendly enough to give us a job now? Oh, maybe. They gave me a shelter. He scowls first at you, then at Decima, who observes the sky carelessly. After a few silent heartbeats, he lets out a grunt. Maybe in the storehouse. But don't not think that I'm going to look after thy horse or cook for thee. All thee canst get is a roof for thy head. It's already plenty. I appreciate it. Just don't tell the others. Oh, no. Uh, do you need any help? I'm looking for a job. He puts his hands together and repeatedly taps his fingers. After a few breaths, he glances at a wandering monk and lowers his voice. Let me see thy horse. How fast is it? You lead both him and Decima to the storehouse. While his steps are heavy and fierce, she doesn't make as much as a sound. Ailey shows no interest in your mount. Is this enchantress she has all we need you to pick up and bring here he glances at the door follow the eastern road until you find the watchtower don't bother with it it's either empty or a lair then head east to the lake this is eudosha i thought you had nothing to do with eudosha you keep talking shit about her uh jabal says the redacted locations would both be spoilers and we haven't been to either yet oh really Sky says, are they doing the formality difference between you and thou? So I guess switching to thou, which is the less formal, is more intimate friendly. Well, before they were kind of switching the other way. It's interesting. Nine says, except Ailey keeps mixing them up. Yeah. Okay. What do you want me to bring? He waves his fingers. A set of quills. We sharpen them and ask her to make them last. Thy pet won't even notice. Why is it such a secret? It's really not. It's just that they're a surprise gift. No, I asked you to this room for a different reason. Uh, okay. What about my reward? What do st thou want? <laughs> uh, I don't want a good word in the order. A healing potion despair would be huge. 
Uh, how much coin do I have? Dragons would also be huge. Seven pouch with coins. I'm gonna ask for the dragons. You asked me for a long and dangerous journey. Five dragons. He narrows his eyes, but finally nods. Fine. They're not much of not of much use for us anyway. Deal. Okay. Oh, also I can get a full heal from um from our forest speaker friend. This is this is going very interestingly. I, I'm I'm liking this. Well, we'll see how good of a rider thou art. He glances at the door and lowers his voice. But there's some other stuff we need from thee. Stuff that takes subtlety and... He straightens up. Dedication to our cause. I'm sorry, I'm not dedicated to your cause. And what cause is that? He rubs his lips with a thumb, gathering his thoughts. I may not care much about some of the souls on this side of Hag Hills, but the tribes deserve our protection and guidance. Aught dark may come from the east and soon. I want thee to investigate the threat. I'm sorry, what threat? What do you want me to do? Swear thou wilt not betray our order. Uh... Why do I have to swear before I help you? This is definitely gonna be some nonsense, right? I I don't feel good about this. Sky says dragons would also be huge. Yes, that's often a thing with dragons being huge. <laughs> Story says maybe baby dragons aren't huge. All right, let's see. I'm just gonna lie about it. I'm just gonna lie about it so I can betray them later if I want to. I. Why are you making me? I. Do I just lie about it? Wait, wait in chat. I don't understand. I don't. They want me to do something secret and subtle that requires dedication to their order and no lying, but it sounds really shady. Should I just say you're asking for too much? Quarrels says this sounds really shady. I think it does sound shady. Jabal says I think if I was looking for a small dragon, I would ask those present here. <laughs> I don't know if any of the dragons here are that small. Ron says too much. I yeah. I, I I felt like lying about it, but I don't intend to betray them. I I wish they would just give me more information. I'll say you're asking too much. I'll do it. A long pause. It's dark here. He sighs and leads you outside. Decima observes your steps carefully. Yeah. Well, they're not going to place Eudocia's rods up until I get a lot more trust from them. So I'm not going to do that. About the things you asked me to do, I'm listening. That's all, yeah. I'm not doing the extra thing. Uh, I have six hours until dusk. I could sleep here. I thought I could sleep here. I unlocked the, the shelter here, but it's not giving me the option. Silly Megan, hello, welcome! Val says you could go to the druid. Do I have time? I would love to go to the druid and get the healing. I have time. I think I have time. I'm going to the Elder's Cave. What if they wanted me to, like, kill Beholder or something? I would never. Quirrell says you can sleep here but it's too early. I did wonder if that was the case. That's probably it. I think you should be able to unlock sleep in his cave now. Really? A flock of colourful birds is circling in the sky. The druid is sitting on the shore, keeping his legs in the water and observing the spring. His gaze is a bit absent and he notices you only after you tap his shoulder. What do you need, traveler? Oh, I need an older voice, don't I? Uh, let's see. Can I have the, the heal? I don't have access to the heal. I would have liked the heal. I'm barely standing. Can I enter the cavern? I need a place to rest. So be it. We are humble people and we do not have much to offer. But at least there's a scrap of floor for you to lie down on and a stream to wash yourself. Follow me. The door, made of steel and surrounded by bricks, could protect a treasury or an armory. The same amount of iron could be used for dozens of tools or over a hundred high-quality spears. 
You wonder what would happen if there were no more druids around. Would scavengers detach it and melt it down? Would it stay here for centuries as a relic of the past? There's a single plate in the middle used to lock or unlock a latch, and an additional padlock which requires its own awkwardly large key. There may be a similar device on the other side. The gate squeals, and moving it makes the man pant. We walk inside. New shelter unlocked! This is so exciting! Oh, I'm so exciting. The heels are reward for the big fish? Oh, I thought the heels were a reward for helping old Pagos. You're right, you're right. Thanks, Quirrell. The cavern is austere, lit only by several candles. The corridor leading deeper underground is flooded. The air is humid, but free of mold and putridity, despite all the wooden furniture around. The man points at a bunch of brown and grey furs laying on the floor, mostly taken from boars and deer, though there's also an especially large one that belonged to a red and black bear. Feel free to pile them up. They should make for a soft bed. Just be sure to spread them around when you wake up. I need them to cover as much of the ground as they can. He also nods toward a wooden table, where you see an array of expensive instruments made of glass, gold, and copper. Bottles, scales, knives, alembics, mortars, a crucible. And if you do need to know much about alchemy, stay away. It is expensive, a keepsake. If I find a single scratch on it, you will need to be welcome here anymore. I look, I look at the woman lying in bed, covered by a blanket. Yeah. She's more touched by time than the man. Her eyes are wide open and observe you with something between fear and curiosity. But when you make eye contact with her, she starts to murmur nervously and covers her head with a blanket. The man also notices her movement and strokes his beard when he sees you looking at her. That's my wife, and the best thing you can do is to ignore her. Her soul is shattered, her shell is weak. She no longer speaks. She was the owner of this table. You ask if she won't be bothered by your presence, and you see his sad smile. She will forget about you as soon as she looks away. She's dangerous, in a way. If you keep your distance, she will near approach you. But when she's stressed, her powers take control over her. Protecting a mad magic user is difficult, Traveller. I'm sorry for your loss. I mean, she's... she's not gone. I won't bother her. He nods and moves toward the door. And you have my thanks. I will need use the padlock. You can leave whenever you want. Your mount will be safe, you can be sure of it. He leaves without another word. This is cool! Cool place! Oh, Story Dragon! Goodbye! Hope you have a lovely rest of the day! I approach the flooded corridor. You take a candle to look down the corridor, but it doesn't help much. It leads downwards, and you see the spot where the ceiling touches the water. Mines often resemble labyrinths, and even if there's any sort of magic which would allow you to swim without air, the risk that you would lose your way back is too grave. I approach the alchemical instruments. The table and shelves contain precise tools and a decent supply of basic substances used as a base for various potions, bombs, or powders, but some of them are a bit too old to be of use. Alemb alchemical procedures take at least a couple of hours, which involve complex preparations of tools, mixing of ingredients, and maintaining the brewing process. Because of this, you have to be a strong shell and sharp soul to make any mixture. Some of them can only be used once. Which mixture would you like to learn more about? I would really love to make a healing potion. Preparation three hours. It's not going to cost me any money! It's just going to require my ingredients. Healing potions may be the most desired liquid in the Dragonwoods, especially among the travelers, hunters, and fighters. The ones you've followed so far are capable of keeping a soul on the verge of death, though it won't fix a freshly cut off limb, nor cleanse one's shell from an illness or poison. They can only be used once. I should really do it. Sabira says, I think this is a scene that will be too familiar to some folks here. There's a really strong mix of emotions in caring for a loved one with dementia. Yeah. Arcadia says, didn't he say not to touch this? He said if I'm not familiar with alchemy, I shouldn't touch it. That's different. I use the first recipe. You chop and grind over two dozen of various herbs into a green pulp, making an ointment with a strong, wound-warty smell, and mix it with the juice of carefully squeezed marsh peels, clean of any seeds and peels. 
So far, so good. Then you spend long, long minutes at the table, constantly keeping the liquid on the brink of boiling, every now and then lowering and raising the small cauldron that hangs above the flame of an oil lamp. The boredom bites your fingers, but you don't even have the time to go grab some water to drink. You think of the alchemists who spend day after day repeating this procedure in their workshops, hardly attempting vision. At least the room is now filled with a pleasant aroma, making the nearby woman much calmer than usual. You pour the grass green liquid into one of the earthenware bottles and seal it. The potion is ready. I clean up everything and step away from the table. Amazing. I love that that worked out well. Okay. Uh, it's sleepy times. I'm going to lose hunger and appearance, but it's free. You can cover yourself with your cape to avoid the draft, but sleeping on a surface made of stone is never comfortable. I'm sleeping. Jabal says, yeah, V is playing the character class that very much can use the equipment fine. Yes. The moon is bright and so is the night. You recognize the shapes of owls and bats and spot movements on the ground. There are many stories about the moon's origins and purpose, and they're older than any of the doctrines known in the cities. These legends are shared not by religions, but rather by tribes, as if they're a part of a deeper conviction, something spread through the milk of mothers and wet nurses, or through the whispers of the trees and wind. The moon is a powerful spirit who watches and guides humankind, when we have no sun to protect us, that's why we call what's in its centre the eye. Or it's a large rock that one day will fall from the sky and crush everything that's alive, starting a new age of darkness. Horrible. For some reason it controls the weather, it gathers weak clouds like a shepherd and shapes the tides. It's a home of strange animals, they are different, but as bright as humans and sometimes visit the land. The moon is up there and we are here now, who cares what it hides? I think given our background, the moon is a powerful spirit. I love this. Quirrell says, oh, the bog knowledge saves the day again. <laughs> Hooray for bog knowledge. Jabal says, I want to believe in clangers. <laughs> this is the, the strange animals. That's the clangers option that they're making soup up there on the moon. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, the moon is a powerful spirit, I think, for, for our character. I love these moments to shape our beliefs and our lore. The man has already left the chamber. Once you start scattering the furs across the floor, the stinging in your back goes away. The woman is sitting next to her bed, swaying back and forth. Okay. I go outside. I think... Ooh, can I approach the spring? I would love to wash. Standing astride the spring water won't be too convenient, but you can shove your head right into the crystal clear water. I wash my shell. I need more bathing equipment. <laughs> the splashes of cold water free you from tallow, sweat, and dirt. I step away. Okay. Let's go to the Enchantress. We can spend the night at Foggy Lake. Then we can head back up to the pier and, and complete our quest with Photius. And to also do a little bit more matchmaking. Uh, Sky says, is shell the word for body here? It is. It's because all all dead things uh, eventually become zombies. <laughs> it's the shell of the soul. Alright. White and grey birds are sitting on the walls without making a sound, giving you tense looks. You touch the cold chest. There's no response. Oh, I've come at the wrong time of day! I have to come after dusk. That's fine. I could try and clear the spider out of the cabin, but I don't think that'll go well. Uh, let's forage at the foraging grounds. That seems worthwhile. Some little furry critters flee away from you through the short grass. Nothing here is as loud as your palfrey's hooves. The runner is still in sight, looking for prey. Ooh. I shouldn't fight this bird by myself, but maybe I can scare it off. The bird's still here, so it's not going to go away. <coughs> I guess I have to scare it away. That's a good point, Jabelle. I'm, like, really weak. It, it's just, I'm described as barely standing. 
True. Let's not fight the bird. Let's travel. The statue of the woman. Can I wash myself in the stream and get slightly... I don't think I can go better than two, but I would love to try. Uh, I can't. Nothing to do here. It is time to help the hunters with the bird, but my health is terrible. Hmm. Well, let's go to Gale Rocks and start completing this quest then. How much time do I have left? Five oh no. I don't have enough time. Two hours and then... Maybe I have enough time? I'm gonna try it. Gale, uh, so we've gone to Gale Rocks. The workers are now resting, preparing themselves for the arrival of the fishes, while the younger locals still have to move wares and tools between the buildings. Wherever there's a table or a bench, there are people feasting on roasted fish and fresh fruits, and the smell of herbs burn your nostrils. The youngsters are focused on their play, overseen by the elders, but even they seem to have little energy left. The laziness covers everyone like a fresh blanket. Some of the locals slow down to observe you, but whenever you meet their eyes, you find a challenge, not amity. You go to... The young people looking for a match. Yes. Okay, so I, I can update Paulus and, and uh, Mar Marina. Okay. So I tell Paulus about Timo's conditions. They seemed well, well matched. He responds with a smile, then warm laughter. And that's all. Of course I agree, as long as she teaches me them pyre dances, or whatever it is they do. Tell her I'll arrive with the spring thaw to meet her. His voice lowers suddenly, cut by pain. Without anyone else, I suppose. He's first to mention the compensation for your service. You're still helping Marina, right? We've already talked to our headwoman. She agreed to reward your work once your matchmaking is done. Be sure to meet her then. Oh, wow! I'm gonna be rewarded for the matchmaking! Jibel says Timo is not much of a theologian. <laughs> Apparently not. I share Shoshi's message with Marina. Her blushing cheeks contrast with the pale skin of her hands. I can't, she says after a longer moment. I thought about our previous conversation, Red Warden. I'm not ready for such changes. Not just because my son deserves the peace we have now. I'd rather join a monastery than but put pure pleasure above prayer. You've already matched Paulus, I've heard, she says, without hiding her jealousy. Go and speak with our headwoman. She'll reward your help. All right. Headwoman? Oh, it's Severina. Oh, it's horrible talking to Severina. I'll do it. You ascend the hill. The guard stands up and puts his woodwork on his pillow, then asks you to wait. You hear his and the headwoman's voices coming from the hall, and once the man returns, he nods gently. You're asked to enter. I follow him inside. Severina puts away her writing instruments and sighs, but doesn't say anything. Her violet eyes are absent. I believe Paulus and Marina already, already talked to you. Right, you've worked for us. Now I can tell one of my neighbours to overlook the usual fees or duties they'd ask of you. Do you need anyone's help? Okay, or my reward is something. And maybe in need of a boat one day? Maybe some free baths and laundry? Five free repairs for my gambas on? That sounds quite good. My armor's kind of fine. I don't fight very much. A free room where I could spend nights? That would be huge. A free room where I could spend nights. What, what does everyone think? What's the most valuable thing here? The food I can get quite cheaply, but the, the room seems very good. Free baths? It would be nice to bathe. I don't know. Jabal says room or boat? Sky says, Bass, you've had a hard time getting yourself clean. Yeah, but I'm not sure it's really affected my journey very much. I can keep myself an, um, a, an acceptable amount clean, apparently. I'm 
curious about the boat. I'm gonna go with a free room. I a free room. Very well. Speak with Fulvia in the evening. She should have a room to spare. She's in the building, just at the edge of a small vegetable field, close to the gate. Great. Um The village of old Pagos has been struggling with a plague. I've helped them overcome it, but the seasons will come to be grim for them. She looks at the perfumed man who's standing with an open mouth. You glance at the crossbow woman, who has lowered her weapon. The head woman leans forward and rests her forehead on the back of her hand. What do you mean, overcome it? She keeps her voice low. Were they just getting cold? You try to tell her the entire story, and even though at first she stares at you from above her clasped fingers, she seems to get smaller and weaker each time you mention the old druid or the mysterious altar at the edge of the swamp. Finally, she stares at the wax tablet, defeated rather than joyful. May the right bless the kindness of that pagan, the god announces briskly. And yours as well, Road Warden. We should call the council soon, but since you've helped our friends in need... Severina, he turns to the old woman, let's offer this stranger some help. Is there some labour you struggle with within our village? Boat discount. Severina raises her head and sighs. I doubt it, but very well. I'll speak with Nathaka, the boat maker. On most days, she works with the carpenters on the eastern bank. Great. I would like to get inside the watchtower standing at the eastern road. I would so I, that would be such a good rest. Is there a Talon here? Talon, hello, welcome. Yeah, I'll to you as well. <laughs> oh man, I, I gotta keep doing work for these people. I'm gonna get baths next. We're gonna be sorted. I'd like to get inside the watchtower standing at the Eastern Road. She didn't trust me enough. She and the perfumed guard exchanged looks. Why would I give you a key? You mentioned that looking after roadside shelters is part of your responsibilities. And she smirks, raising her hand slightly. Ah, you don't say. We're not an old Pagos. One's duty means nothing here until a soul proves they can be trusted. I would have rather had a key to that than a stinky room in your stinky town, but okay. Fine. What time is it? Three hours before dusk. But I can sleep here. How good is the sleep here? I asked for directions to Fulvia. Following the instructions, you reach a building with an entrance from the garden side. You step through the door leading into the mouth of the cave and call the person you are told to speak with, Fulvia, the roomkeeper. She comes to you from the half-dark corridor. She fits the description you heard. Slightly round, partially because of the tunic and heavy pants, hidden beneath the dark green robe. She looks like an eccentric city priest, what with the massive hourglass made of beautifully polished driftwood she wears, and the kerchief covering both her neck and hair. One feature that hasn't been mentioned by the locals are her eyes. Grey, asymmetrical, partially closed and unfocused. When she gets closer, she turns her head, gazing into the rock and pointing her left ear at you. Her steps are confident and her hands keep touching the walls on both sides. She's old, wrinkled and pale, but her voice remains strong. Your first instinct is to nod, only then realising it won't really help you much. She repeats, You smell of a horse. Room? Yes. Right. She simply walks down the corridor between the few humble chambers, some of which are inhabited by sleeping souls. After just a few steps, the light coming from the entrance helps you no more. You follow the sounds of boots and the smell of rosemary perfume, then suddenly hear a rock hitting something made of metal. The lit candle makes you sigh with relief. What colour? After a quiet moment, she tries again. The horse coat. It has white and black stripes. My horse is a is a zebra. <laughs> well, it's shadow fact, so it must be grey. She lets out a surprised grunt. So far from the growing mountains. Guess there are some grey hills around here. The room is far from comforting. The ceiling is only a head above you. The walls are rounded and bare of any decorations, and the only chest looks more like a crude crate. At least the dried grasses covering the sleeping pallet are bug-free and smell of freshness. You don't have to share it, she says with amusement. How much for this delight? This is terrible! This is my free room! She chuckles, still turns to you with her profile. Don't worry, you won't be cold. We don't let anything mold in here. 
I have a nose for it. She demonstrates the loud sniff. You can work for the village for merely a few hours in the morning, move some weights around, or you can pay me two coins. I won't take less, for I need none at all. I'll just throw it to Severina's chest in a few days. I'm sorry! After you explain that you were promised a free service, she shrugs. So you're that road warden, are you? Right, alright. Okay, it is free, it is free. Okay. Rent zero. Love it. I will gain a health. Great. Uh, I'm gonna go find Fot Photius. Two hours. I might be able to make it. It's only 15 minutes to the pier. Okay. On your way north, the fishers greet you with polite nods and tired looks. Some of them carry the boats and tools, dividing the weight between them, while the others are pulling the ropes attached to the wide barge, moving it up the river slowly. The silver fishers are almost flowing out of the barrels. I slow down and talk to them. Photius discusses plans for tomorrow with the other workers, but politely nods to you. Uh, about the spirit rock. I didn't want to do the spirit rock. The forest speaker said that I could- <laughs> I could say that the priest said it was risky. I- I don't have this option. You've got it? No. I think what you're asking for may be risky. Hang on. Knowledge. Good. Okay. Why would it be? No one has ever been hurt by the previous stones. Knowledge. I have studied many tales, both legends and archives. There is no alchemy that could change the nature of the spell as soul. That's not what I need. I travel to the old druid you had mentioned. He's convincing you to accept the way the spirit shaped your daughter's soul, not change it. That, but the druid didn't think that that would be worth saying. The druid thought I should go to the monastery. Okay. Ailey, the voice of the monastery, says that you've, you need to forget tales about being soulless. Not casting spells doesn't make someone a lesser human. Wright's tablets are clear on that. Should I use my scholar knowledge, or should I say what the Ailey, the monastery person, said? The forest speaker did say that I should go to the monastery to convince Photius. So I think that's probably the best co course. I don't know what everyone else thinks. I would have liked to have spoken to the Enchantress first, but... Jabal says, try Ellie first, I think, then maybe back it up with your own know-how if further arguments are needed. Ah, oh, I might need loads of arguments. But I hadn't thought of that. Quirrell says, the monastery knowledge was the hardest to get, so you'll probably get best use out of that. Rowan says, go with Ailey's words. Yes, okay. Quirrell says, yes, I'm a shameless metagamer. <laughs> so the monastery says you need to forget the tales. How does he... He suddenly scowls at you. Fine. If the monks say the right says so, I'll believe it. But wouldn't you try to heal a cut arm or a broken back? Even if her soul is, well, in her, it's going to struggle. I've studied many tales, both legends and archives. There is no alchemy that could change the nature of a spellless soul. So now you ain't only a drifter, but also a scholar. If you're so smart, maybe get back to your pens and inks and leave the risks to me. I travel to the old druid you had mentioned. He's convinced you need to accept the way the spirits shaped your daughter's soul, not change it. Spirits? Why would you even listen to this pagan nonsense? He's just pushing his lies into you, he is. I'm just going to look for more people. That's all I have to say. I'll come back when I know more. All right. I was sent here by an old druid from the south. He claims that you owe him a male empress cup. What? I owe nothing to that old fool. You can have it here tomorrow if you want, but better have a coin with you. I need to ask someone to look for it with a net. That will take hours. A coin. Okay. Ooh. Well, you're terrible. I'm going back to Gale Rocks. Let's go sleep. Free sleep. But we're gonna be starving when we wake up. And stinky. Okay. This game's hard. After Fulvia blows out the candles without considering if you're ready for it, you are in complete darkness and you only now realize how quiet this room is. The thick walls blocking the humming of the wind birds the river. The keeper heads to her own room and you only occasionally hear the whispers or snores of other dwellers. My imagination sculpts terrifying creatures in the darkness and it takes me a while before I calm down. I grow anxious as I focus on my breath, then on the beating of my heart. 
I hold onto my dagger and focus on the touch of my blanket. Or finally some peace. I think I'm scared. I'm imagining creatures. It's too dark. You're surrounded by darkness. You quickly gather your things and leave the room without a word from the keeper, who's sitting outside next to the open door. The village is hurriedly preparing for a busy day. The workers gather the wagons at the gates, push the barrels onto the barge, move equipment out of the sheds, and shove meals into their bags. The alleys aren't much calmer. The overseers are waking up their crews and discussing their goals and plans. The only souls that can afford a longer rest are the children and the elderly. Some of the locals slow down to observe you, and when you meet their eyes, you find a few smiles. Yes! You go to... I'm going to go to Photius. Do you need help fishing today? I would really love some money. Uh, did you catch the Empress Carp? Let's try that first. Right, and a few of them, but most of them females. He approaches the nearby shed and brings you a bucket covered with lids that are held by hemp cords. He lets you hold it for a bit. It's heavy and its weight shifts as if it's filled with water. You'll need to deliver it quickly or it's going to choke itself to death. Um, or die of hunger. I don't know much about keeping fish alive, but if it dies, I can sell you another one for another coin. Okay, I'll tell you when I'm ready to take it in that case. Let's help with fishing and then we'll get the Empress Cup. Rowan says he's still the worst. He is. Need help with fishing? Ooh, I will gain some hunger, but it will take an unknown amount of appearance and... Okay, well... You'll keep an eye on the caught fish equipment and resting fishes. This task will take you an entire day and make it dangerous. But if so, you'll get an extra dragon bone? Let's do it. I need the three, the three coins would be huge. Oh, no, no. A large saurian tried to get inside the shelter, lured by the smell of fish. You and your companions managed to fight it off, but as the frontline fighter, you took a serious hit from its claws. At least you receive a fresh roasted fish with a bowl of cold veggie stew and some dried nuts, and an extra dragon bone for your effort. Oh no. I have ten dragon bones, which is how many I need to give the woman in the necromancer village, but I need to spend one right now. Okay, I need an empress cart. I'll pay you the one dragon bone. See you later. Oh, I took it too soon! I need to sleep! Oh! It's gonna... Oh, no! No! Three hours. I don't have time. I can sleep here for free. I should wash myself in the ocean if I can. What? It didn't help. <laughs> oh. The water is freezing and after you're done, sand makes you wait for a while before you dry up enough to put your clothes back on. The unpleasant touch of salt covering your skin will travel with you. I pack my things. It didn't increase! It said plus one and then nothing happened! Ugh, <sighs> travel. I'm gonna travel here for a free, terrible sleep. Sky says, do you have any abilities or knowledge that'll help you keep the fish alive? I don't think so. It depends on how long it means that I need to tra travel it quickly. But I need to sleep. Uh, sleep? Zero rent. I do love the zero rent. The rain once again hits the ground, interrupting your sleep. Another day of muddy roads. No! Ah! Okay. Well. Inventory. Is the fish still alive? Still alive. Let's travel. Nine hours, seven minutes, and then we sleep there. People don't want to talk to me. I'm stinky and horrible right now. A trail of black ants is crossing the road, carrying leaves, dried blades of grass, and little sticks. The old man is resting on the bench. He welcomes you with a resigned sigh. What do you need, traveler? 
Um, I brought you what you asked for. He looks inside the bucket quickly, then gives you a big smile. Now I'm in your debt, traveller. Let me know if you need a healing touch. I don't, but I probably will soon. He closes the bucket again and puts it on the bench. I would like to bathe. I wash my shell. In an hour I'll move blood stains from my clothes. Oh, let's do that. That didn't help. Why is it not going bigger? I wash my shell. There's one. <laughs> what is going wrong? Yeah, I don't want to use the full heal yet. Um, I'm, I'm nearly at full health. This is quite well. alchemical instruments. Can I make a blinding powder? No. Can I make a sharpening poison? No. Can I make another healing potion? I need more wound ward. That's probably going to cost me money, so I'm not going to be able to do that. Alright. It's not time to sleep yet. I could travel to Foggy's and get some food in me. It'll cost me a coin to sleep. I can't get there before nightfall. Health of the North is really expensive. I guess I just wait here for bed. Can you ask him more about the peninsula now? I don't know. What can you tell me... about the peninsula? I mean, it won't... I don't have any questions about Asterion. You can. I've lived here for almost a century, travelled both by the pass and through the wilderness. His voice becomes stronger and makes you think of a bard. But I will need be your guide or a teacher, and if it's the if the thing if there's anything I can wish for, it is that you will stay away from the woods. The creatures get angrier the more we take from them. They do only listen to our warnings, and one day they'll bury us under a storm of claws and fangs. There will nay be a soul to spare a tear after us. His eyes are as harsh as a hawk's, making him look like a priest who hears a child asking for honey on a day of ceremonial fasting. Dooney poke the hornet's nest, Dooney ride east, and never use the path that runs through the heart of this land. That road was meant to save time, but brings only death. Be a servant, nay an overseer, Dooney try to bend this place to your will. He points at you and wags his finger after every word. Your will, anyone's will is the key to danger, nay salvation. I mean, I don't want to control the land, but I do want people to be able to be safe here. Uh, I mean, thank you. He's observing your lips. Do you need anything else? I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't have anything else to say about Asterion. Um, is there anywhere I can travel to in this time in the back? There's the horrible ruins. I don't want to go there. I could travel to Howler's Dell? That might be worth it. Once you're done with the unpacking, three armed men show up behind you. Their gambas ones are tightly fastened, eyes grim. Oh no, she's mad at me because I helped save old Pagos! No! She wants to see you, says the man with the braided beard. He's holding a large stone mace. And you'll come now. After you then. No! I, I definitely haven't been here since I pissed them off, Jabal. This is bad. Krill says, how long will it take to get to the Enchantress? It was too long. Hours. You're surrounded by curious glances and worried whispers. Thias is in her usual spot holding a mug with both hands. She doesn't have to say a thing. The dining neighbors get on their feet and leave the square without bothering with their plates. Eric's enters the building. Akakios heads towards the tiny islet. Excluding the guards who, who watch your every step, you two are alone. She waves her hand and you get pushed onto a stool, almost hitting the ground. 
Forgive us all these precautions, she says with a thick local accent, observing you with piercing green eyes. But I'm not sure who you are. Near an ally, near threat. Her pale fingers are tapping on the wood, yet her face is like a statue. Okay, we've got options. I'm a road warden the people of Old Pagos called for help, and I answered. May they keep their scrap of the land safer for the sake of us all? I was just pursuing my goals, it doesn't need to affect our common efforts. I wouldn't forgive myself for sacrificing this many lives. You can spare one magic fruit for them, Thias. I mean, that's kind of how I feel, but I feel like it's a bit antagonistic. Maybe the first one? The magic fruit? They've been using tr a fruit from Beholder to make their village prosperous. But we used that fruit by- I, I made the fruit grow by sacrificing almost all of my blood so that we could give the fruit to the druid so that the druid could cure the plague in Old Pagos. And they were super mad about it in Howler's Dell. They were like, what do you mean you want to cure people of plague? That's ours so that we can eat good. And, and behold, it only gives one fruit per year. Exactly, Jabal, thank you. I don't know, I don't know whether I should do the first one about being a road warden or the last one. I just think I couldn't, I, I, the last one is why I did it. But I feel like it's a bit antagonistic. Rowan says, I guess the first one, but geez, yeah. Massive geez energy right now. What the heck? This is not chill. <laughs> Rowan says, I can't believe they're mad you save people from plague. Absolutely, and their village is super fine. They're fine. Jabal says, I'm going to say nothing on this one. I'm gonna go with the first one. Your view of the peninsula is off. You can help us all, yet stay on the side. When some of us gain, others lose. You took away our treasure, and now one of us will die because of it. A sick elder, a weak child, a hunter who can't be healed with a spell. Her eyes narrow and keep piercing through your skull. Would you push one of us from a cliff to save another village? How about killing me? How many lives am I worth? If I had no other choice than to decide, I would. Murdering someone would not be the same thing. It would not. Have mercy on me, Thias. I was meant to deliver messages, kill goblins, and escort travellers. And I don't even kill goblins. I take no pleasure in making these decisions. Truth. She straightens up and pushes her mug to the side. You're biting off more than you can chew, and we're paying the price. You are near a leader. You do not understand the price such sacrifices put on one's soul. She raises her chin. And they will break you. Either grow a spine or follow those who did. Sure, you may be right. I'm not petty, Strider. You're a little petty. She returns to the accent of the city folk. You can still enjoy your stay at our lovely village, she says with a sigh, then puts on her usual smile with a hint of a smirk. We can still use your services. You may be a stranger, but at least you carry dragon bones. The guard pushes you away and the other people read it as a sign. They get back to their tasks and meals, avoiding your eyes, and the air gets lighter. I look around. Horrible! Terrible! Hate it! Leave the square. I'm gonna talk to T Timo. She's at the creek, but takes a break to speak with you, apologizing for her crude appearance. Oh, I'm sure I look worse. She gasps for air with her hands on her knees, which looks you directly in the eyes. I have an answer from Paulus. She shouts and jumps toward you, throwing her arms around your neck. And I had such an awful day! Thank you! With tears in her eyes, she steps away, though your clothes and cheeks are already covered with droplets of water. Of course, nothing is said for sure! Her calm words are betrayed by her excited tone. I'll ask my Uncle Ak, I mean Akakios, to never be so rabid when he swaps dragon bones with you. Oh, great! After another few moment, minutes of her insisting that you have to come to the wedding, if it occurs, but nothing for sure, but you must promise, but who knows, but you must be there. You leave her with her friends. See you soon. That was a love, that was a lovely ending to that quest. I'm not sleeping here. Thias is gonna have me lynched. I'm not staying here. I am leaving. 
she wanted me to stand up for myself, but she was threatening me with like large men with like maces, so I'm I don't regret my decisions. A shiny empress carp with golden orange and golden scales swims near the shore, hoping to get some tasty scraps of bread. The old man is grinding something in a bowl placed on a ta table like rock next to the closed entrance. What do you need, traveller? Uh, I would like to sleep. Sleep. Oh, I'm gonna be so hungry! Sleep. Okay, we're gonna travel to Foggy's. We're gonna get some food, then it will be late, and we will travel to the Enchantress. Yes. Probably that's good. <laughs> then we'll have one more thing to say to the stupid Photius that I don't like very much. Okay. There's a hint of a strange stench and fresh claw marks left on the ground. A large saurian entered and left the yard through the lake. The foragers are inspecting the boat, talking about their recent fishing trip. The taller man welcomes you with a nod. I can do a hunting trip with him now. Uh... I approach Foggy. I'd like to eat. She stretches out her arm and grabs a bowl. Give me a moment. You sit down at the clean table. After a moment, the keeper brings you a bowl of simple gruel, two roasted bird thighs, and a mug of acorn brew. Once you're done, Foggy packs the leftovers for you as a snack for the rest of the day and mentions that you've already paid for another one meal. I'd like to eat that too. And then I would like to buy more meals. There we go. Uh, time for me to go. I go outside. Three hours to get there. Seven hours before dusk. What time... What time do I have to get to the Enchantress? It can't be after dusk because then I can't sleep. But she, I'm sure it says after dusk. It, it just has to be late in the day, right? And this is not late enough. But will it be late enough by the time I get there? If anyone remembers, I, I don't know how to, like, it, it's clearly it's already noon. What else do I have to do right now? I need to make some more coin. I could help the foragers. I'll get some money for doing that. I could do that right now. I approach the foragers. Zvi is sitting on the ground while two others are leaning against the palisade. They glance toward you but say nothing. I have everything I need. Let's hunt while it's still early. Oh, let's just do it. Ilan clasps his hands. Then we're going! Idiot, take care of the horse! He nods toward the man with one hand. Oh, that's meant to be a different man, I think. <laughs> Ilan proudly puts a rope and bag on his shoulders while Svi shoves everything under his black cloak. They gather by the gate and mock their companion as he toddles toward the lake with an empty bucket. Why are you so horrible? I grab whatever may be of use from my bags and scratch Shadowfax's neck. Alright. This is probably going to go disastrously. The brook is cleaner than ever and your palfrey happily takes a short break to quench its thirst. The statue stands in all its glory, observing the road and those who use it. The coin you left in the wooden bowl is no longer here. <laughs> Someone took it. A nice thing, isn't it? Ilan thunders behind you. It's older than our home. What do you say, Chips and Zvi? Do you have such things by Hovlavin on the roads? Carrying your belongings on your own is surprisingly tiring, and you make noises with every turn. We do, but they're old, from before the war. He makes a satisfied grin. The war has ruined everything, hasn't it? All the monuments and places and temples and slave owners. Poor, poor northerners. Oh, gosh. After a short chuckle, the larger man goes on. What sort of statues are there used to be? Uh, all sorts of important figures. Heroes of rights, ta tablets, local champions, famous adventurers. That's kind of boring. People pay sculptors to honour themselves, to make themselves remembered after their passing. Oof. They mark places of importance or spots where important events have happened. They don't portray actual people. I like that very much. Ilan nods. Stories over people, eh? That's what you get when you base prayers and gods on old tablets. Some of the southern tribes do the very same. The absent eyes of the statue have nothing to add. So do you know who this is? Nah. 
Elon is more focused on the fish breaking through the surface of the lake. It's old, and the woman is a stranger. I heard no stories of it. My ma could. It was me who got rid of those bushes, you know. V narrows his eyes, but speaks with a cheerful tone. Ah, and I thought a bee ate the leaves, but there are no paw prints around, I. I don't think anyone on the coast is going to kneel before it, adds the larger man. But I guess it does look nicer now. Yeah, because no one cared that I did that. I care, though. We should move on. Aye, let's not linger, says Elan as he walks down the road. We move forward. I cared about clearing that. The valley seems especially peaceful today. A couple lizards are resting on the rocks and basking with no worries. Ilan points east to the large bird at the edge of the horizon, which freezes in the middle of a step and turns its orange head in your direction. See? Time to get ready. What's the plan? Well, avoid the beak and the legs and the trample. He pauses, inspecting the loop at the end of his rope. And don't hurt it if you don't have to. We don't want it to be a bother. Zv jauntily drops his belongings in the middle of the road and jumps in place. Rhythmically, rhythmically breathing. After he takes off his black cloak, he reveals a set of fancy clothes made of black leather. The clothes of a sneaky adventurer. Charges like a moron. Be nimble, that's all. One or two ropes on the neck and we're halfway home. But don't let it pass you by, eh? Should I also take a rope? I can throw it at the bird and pull once it gets behind me. I don't know, friend, says Ilan. Roping isn't easy. Don't be too reckless. We don't have magic on our hands. We can't buy another road warden, as his companion. So don't make this a bad trade for us. I wait for them to get to the sides of the valley, then approach the bird. Oh! It's taller than Shadowfax, with wide breast and long, thick, partially feathered legs that could easily trample your chest. Its thighs are thick and powerful. The pointy beak could swallow your entire forearm. Your steps are getting closer. Ooh! Rowan says, aw, somebody who actually thinks you have value. I did appreciate it, but they're not very nice men. Uh, I look around nervously. Are the foragers in position? I don't think so. I need to calm myself down. I focus on my breath. Maybe. I try to speak confidently. How's it going? Can you just maybe wait patiently in place so my companions can nicely tie you up? Once you get to the pen with us, you'll have all the rats and pigeons you can eat. I like that one. I beat my chest with a fist and let out a shout. I won't die to some stupid bird. I mean, I might. I'm going to talk to the bird. The bird, mo bird moves forward even before you finish your sentence, clearly unimpressed by your promises. But the sound of your voice and the illusion of control helps calm you down. Your hands hold your equipment firmly and your legs are already bent, ready to jump. You can handle it. Soon the bird is surrounded by your group and the pond behind it blocks its path of escape. Once it realizes that, it speeds up, charging in your direction. Take a good look at the monster. It's tall, wide, with a massive head. Its feathers are torn by the wind. They are vividly brown, white, and creamy, longer than your hand span, coating the creature like a cape. Its steps are heavy and deliberate. The neck, as long as a limb, keeps moving around, sometimes staring at you with but a single black pupil surrounded by deep orange. The light gray beak resembles the leaves of the local plants. The tip is curved, pointy, and in no way smooth. It carries dozens of grooves, maybe a sign of old age, or maybe a trace of hundreds of hunts. I try to find its weak spot, it's just a huge duck. A uh, respectable opponent, I may be forced to kill it after all? I hope not. Am I even ready to face it? Probably not. The, j the huge duck thing. Jabal says, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck road warden? <laughs> or what? <laughs> one horse... Duck sized horse? I guess the duck sized horse. The duck sized horse, please. Uh, I try to find its weak spot. It waits no more. It raises its head and makes a long, piercing screech, which fills up the entire valley. The feathers on its neck are shaking, but also waving, moved by the muscles. It then flaps its wings and lunges forward, still shouting, charging at you with full force. Uh, I don't have a potion that could help me. I can't win. I should try to rope it. I keep my distance. They're going to catch it, not me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep my distance. Jabal says I need to scoot soon. Bye. Good luck. Oh, goodbye, Jabal. I hope you have a good rest of the day. I'm dodging. 
Oh, I lost my armor. The giant feet are pounding the ground with every leap, scuffing up the clouds of leaves and sand. It lowers its long neck, pointing it at you like one would a spear. You do your best to find a balance between running to safety, jumping away from the beak, and staying close to the bird's attention. Its reflexes are so quick that you can't imagine doing all this while also trying to strike it back. Finally, the beast lands a hit. Your gambeson does its job and protects your flesh. Though in pain, you manage to leap away, then wait for another charge. I'm not supposed... I don't understand what I'm supposed to do here. Be I guess I'm supposed to eventually grapple it. Because I'm not supposed to hurt it. I'll try and rope it. You prepare to throw yourself to throw and the creature gets distracted by the approach of your companions. Your loop lands on its head so you pull, squeezing the monster's thick neck. It twists its shell in anger then runs at you, not giving you a chance to choke it. While you may still be in danger, you now have an additional way to stop it from running away. Uh... When do they catch it? I don't... I guess I'll grapple it. I'll make a quick dodge and grapple it. That hurt. You wait to duck at the very last moment. You try to catch the beast from the side, but it has enough time to peck your shoulder. Your gambeson already damaged isn't enough, and you feel the stickiness of your blood. You press your shell against the monster's wing, trying to avoid its legs. The runner, as confused as you are, makes an angry screech and tries to shake you off. The feathers are scratching your cheeks and getting in your mouth. Once the bird gets rid of you, it runs east, not aware that it only helps your companions. I guess I'll just dodge when necessary. Please let something happen different. I'm very hurt. You do your best to find a balance between running to safety, jumping away from the beak, and staying close to the birds, hold the bird's attention. Its reflexes are so quick that you can't imagine doing all this while also trying to strike it back. Okay, we've already done that. What am I, when does it change? Maybe a good moment to open my bag and drink a healing potion? Probably. I do have one drink. Alright. I gotta try and grapple it and hopefully I'll get a successful one. Rowan says combat in this game is extremely annoying. I think it's the, the main weak point of the game. It's an amazing game. The combat, I feel like I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing or how to get the correct answer. And it has dice rolls next to it, so I guess it's just random. I make a quick dodge and grab it. I got hurt again. Hang on. That's when the loop lands on its neck, I succeeded, tightening quickly and V shouts cheerfully. The bird remains silent, maybe already out of breath. But then it dashes forward, so fast you can't help but step back. It either doesn't understand the danger involved in moving in its situation or doesn't care about it. It runs forward, trying to flee. It makes two, five jumps. You hear Ilan swear. Without looking at him, you know that he let go of the rope. Uh, since I've already caught it with my own rope, all I have to do is stop it from getting away. I lose some appearance. You dash to your rope and start to roll it with both hands. You plant your feet on a convenient rock then pull, feel it felling the bird onto its side, but its strength and weight knocks you down as well. It tries to get up, but you keep pulling, fighting against its muscular neck and legs. Elan comes to the rescue. It's now two against one, and the beast can't make as much as a step. Once V grabs the second rope, the battle is over. The bird staggers, trying to keep its head straight until, exhausted, it falls on the ground. Time to regroup. The bird keeps trying to find a way out with little luck. Once it regains a bit of strength, it charges at you, but after just two leaps, it gets stopped with a second rope. It regains its voice, screeching at its tormentors, but there's something more hidden behind its previous threats and anger. Maybe pain, maybe contempt. A damn, damn good job, thunders Ilan. He starts to laugh. You were jumping around like a monkey. You have some legs. Ah, you're good with, good with the loop, adds V loudly, gasping for breath after a long run. Better take this. He gives you his own fine quality rope. We won't untie that one of yours anytime soon. Shag me, I missed my throat. Ugh. He shakes his head with a mixture of anger and embarrassment. Good thing we hired you. Great, let's let's go. We should go. If anything tries to get to us, we'll struggle to keep the bird on the rope. I can't argue with that. Elon stretches his large, large legs and prepares his bags. We're not much of fighters. I don't wish to pay you for saving us on the road. The other forager chuckles as he stays away, keeping the exhausted bird on the taut rope. We're ready if you are. I gather my belongings and lead the men north, looking out for any beasts. Alright, well, we did it. I'm not sure if it was worth it. 
Every few minutes the runner tries to get away, and even though it's exhausted you have to move slowly, paying attention to its steps. The foragers seem to know what they're doing, and at no point you feel threatened by the creature. You keep looking around, but the other beasts seem to stay away. At one point you notice a blue wolf among the shorter grasses, but it only observes you in silence, standing on all paws as if it's ready to run away. Your anxious companions fall quiet, but you keep moving forward. In the middle of your journey you think about shadow facts. During your stroll everything seems taller, and the creatures you pass by feel more real, as if they are no longer just shadows for you to leave behind. Being on the road without it feels lonely. Plus five monies. Oh, we might actually achieve something. Foggy observes you from the top of the stairs with the hand resting on her stomach. Well done, dears, she grins at the sight of the runner. Tether it close to the water. Love, she looks at you. Be nice and head to Creeks today or tomorrow, will you? Tell Efren we're coming and to give you a bone for the message. She glances at the man with one hand as he scowls at the beast. Before she enters the door, she smiles at her son. Once you're done, wash your hands and come for dinner. Tell me everything. Tethering the creature to a beam takes you a few minutes. Ilan's gasping for air, leaning on his knees, and while Svi keeps his posture straight, his red face betrays him. Well, says the tall man, I have your dragons here. Thank you for your good work, friend. The ring-shaped bones are covered in his sweat. Alright, um, I guess we'll go to Creeks now? Do I have time? I do. I'll get clean. I can get clean in Creeks. Oh, Ila and Efren are on the bridge discussing something as they look at the flowing clear stream. They welcome you politely and ask you about your day. I have some good news for you. I helped the boys from Foggies catch a large bird that will soon be brought through here. While you try to stay to the point, Efren is full of energy. He asks about every detail from the animal's size to the way it acted in combat. Your brief answers are met with shouts echoed by the silent bounces of the wolf's head. It was a brave venture. I'm glad they didn't try it without you. Ila gestures for the hunter to drop it. Thank you for giving us time to repair. I was also told to ask for one dragon bone. Aye, of course. The carpenter looks around. Pay for the messenger. Just give me a minute. He scurries away as quickly as his thick legs would allow him. We don't carry dragons with us, the hunter explains. So, how large is the beak? Something like this? He demonstrates the size with his hands and after another few minutes showers you with questions. Finally, the dragon bone finds its place in your hand. I... I'll get the preparation soon, concludes Ela, gasping for air and leaning against the railing while Efren lopes away, apparently to prepare the animal pen as there's no time to waste. The carpenter invites you to follow him to his working station. <sighs> okay. Well, that went okay. I'll see you later. I would like to bathe. Slightly better than I was. I can get up to two in, in creeks, I think. I can't in this one. I have to find another one. I can bathe here. How many hours do I have left? Three. No. One. Yeah. This will do it. Siberia says not bad as hunting goes. No one died. Yeah. And we didn't ha we didn't even kill the animal, which I'm really pleased about. I wouldn't have done it if we were going to kill it. Um, I'm going to wash myself in this stream. I can't get cleaner. Ugh. I'm going to go sleep at Foggy's, I guess. What time do I have left? Two hours and 15 minutes. Then I will go sleep at Gale Rocks where it's free. And then I will go eat at Foggy's. Oh. Free sleep. Hardly any light reaches the ground through the clouded sky. The deep night, as some call it. So dark that you can't see the fingertips of your extended hand. You try to look outside, but to no avail. Even the predators will spend the next few hours hidden, unsure what surrounds their shelters and hideouts. Not all of them, though. You hear cheerful howling coming from the heart of the forest. A hunt queen, or maybe a hunt lord, has already captured its next meal. I should feel safe in such a well-guarded village, but just in case, I crawl to the window and make sure it's closed. Okay. That went well. Then... Then I travel to Foggy's and I get food. <laughs> oh gosh, what a time I'm having. I enter the tavern. I approach Foggy. I eat. 
It would be great to fix my clothes, but you know what? Travel, save. <sighs> so the next big thing I need to do is go to the Enchantress. But I've got to time it right, and that's difficult. I need to repair my gambus on. I can have that done there. I can have it done in Gale Rocks as well. Gale Rocks is nearby. I guess I'll try Gale Rocks. Okay. I'd like to take on the skeleton cave soon. Also, wait, do we have enough money to give the woman some coins? Oh, we do! Let's do that today. Uh, the tailor. Rufina the tailor. Once you enter the dark cave room, Rufina welcomes you with a nod. Is everything fine? What can you do for me? I can have partially restored gambus on. Yes. Plus one appearance for my clothes to be patched. If I work for two hours, I will do that. That's all really good. Okay. I gotta head outside. I need to get to White Marshes. Creepers are in the way. I don't have a potion that does them, so I have to go to the peat fields and get some food to Thursis, and then I can go here and then I can give the woman. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Hi, Thursis. Could you open the path? Oh, another person I can ask. There's a man living in Gale Rocks who tries to heal his spellless daughter. Yes, Thursis. What do you think about that? The wallet cuts in right after you mention Eudocious Rock. Whatever it is, there's no, there's no way anyone other than a real prophet would help that girl. Noom was weak in my tribe, you know. Myself, I'm gifted. Yep, but I had no teachers here. He shrugs his arms, making the creepers bend upward. Took the pagan priest from Aula's Dell to help me twist more than a twig. If there was a way to put Numa in shells for good, people would kill to find it. Cool. You were training with the druids? The forest speakers. His mocking voice makes him sound like a brat. I left when I was a teen years ago, if not more. After everything went to shit. He suddenly pauses and waves it off. After a few more questions, he speaks slowly, observing your eyes. Don't get me wrong, I did learn a lot, especially from that one old man. THE forest speaker, uh, but his daughter kept making me meditate, and I'm not one to sit still. His amulets rattle from his flinch. We paid them for teaching me, but they broke their word, kept telling me for spirits lumber and for rights poison. After his annoyed scoff, he bites his tongue and taps his toes nervously. You ask about the old man, but Thursus runs out of patience. I don't know, the one with the real gift. He studied all the cere guided all the ceremonies, yet was arguing with the others all the time, I don't care. He was good for nothing, like all of them. Thursis, I didn't know you were so unpleasant to f good druids. All right, I need you to open the path to White Marshes, please. All right, and he wants something. Let me just give you loads of wild fruits and leaves. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I can't get there by nightfall. I didn't know the timing was so bad. Uh, I have to seek shelter. I'm gonna lose some health. Oh, the time management is just brutal. On your way to the village, you see a girl no older than 15 walking through the tall purple grasses, along with a few other youngsters. After she notices your arrival, she runs toward the road, waving to draw your attention. Am I going to White Marshes for shelter? I stop. Can I help you? It takes her a few more moments to reach you. Her clothes are baggy, appropriately so for her age, but she's also rather scraggy for a labourer. She carries a slingshot and a simple backpack made of creepers and twigs, filled with green leaves, wild fruits, and a dead squirrel lying on the surface. After your question, she gives you a curious glance. Road Warden, parents told me. 
Not sure which part of it is a question. You nod in agreement. But what is it that one does, really? Hunt bounties? I mostly patrol the roads and travel between villages. Some reward and seek bounties, yes, but I do all sorts of things, whatever's needed. Oh, you're an adventurer, then? She makes an odd displeased grimace, then sneezes um, and smiles at you. Not really. Adventurers are paid to do odd jobs, but often don't follow the city laws nor the local ones, unlike road wardens. Yeah, it makes sense, she nods, but looks around with a frown. So you're a mercenary of sorts? They do follow laws, if the pay's right. Even less so, mercenaries follow the rules of their employers, but they get hired only as fighters. Either as guards or one-time soldiers. They mostly learn how to fight other humans. But aren't you a soldier? She waves toward her companion, showing them not to worry about her. You work for the city, right? Uh, I do, but I work only with my mount and answer only to the chieftain. I've not no lieutenant and I'm required to handle many tasks on my own. Securing shelters, for example, or staying alive in the wilderness. I don't occupy any specific spot and I'm not allowed to collect taxes. I'm not a soldier. Her tone is confident when she pats a slingshot. Hear this then. You're part pathfinder, part adventurer. The city pays you to cross the woods by yourself and you do odd jobs for your own sake. Yeah, you figured it out, sure. I did! She meets your eyes proudly. I guess there's a tiny reason to call such a solo road, Warden. Safe travels! She waves to you and runs back to the rest of her group. I'm going, I went to White Marshes for, for shelter. Oh, gosh. Well, at least I can sleep here and I've got the woman. I can give it to the woman. You ride along a trail of blood which disappears near the well. The locals spread quickly, leaving you with a few guards and many, many more awoken shells. I and mean, this is kind of good because I really want to give the, the money to the woman. Because the pouch she sent me to collect, there was no money in it. Sky says, I'm off to class. It's been a wonderful time with you. Enjoy the game. I think you might have found yet another one I need to check out. Do try it, Sky. It's really good. I hope you have a good time at class and it goes well. See you. I'm about to finish as well. I need to give the woman the pouch. She's just at the edge of the yard, keenly observing you. And as you approach her, she once again leads you further away from the gate, this time behind a turf house. She reaches out to you with an open palm and speaks quietly. May the right bless you, stranger. Well, that's not a lie. There was one, there was one coin. Here's the one, okay, why don't I say, lie, you were correct, here are your 10 dragon bones, yes. She said there was 20 and I would get 10, there was only one. She stares at the coins in silence, holding the tears, then lets out a relieved sigh and shoves the dragons into a small linen sheet then pushes it behind her jacket, filling the space between her breasts. I prayed for so long, she whispers, tying the straps. And thanks to you, I can leave this forsaken place with the next caravan. She flinches and looks around the corner. She speaks quickly. I mustn't be found. I won't tell what you did for me. But if any spark of right's decency in you, speak with Thersis, the warlock. He's the last soul that speaks against Arentius. You hardly understand the last few words. She's already scurrying away, gesturing for you to head to the gate. And so I do. Okay, we've successfully got this woman out. She's frightened of everyone. She's obviously trapped. I'm glad that we've done that. Um, I'm going to save. And then do a big save. And then I think that's, that is it for today, everyone. Thank you so much for keeping me company today. Uh, I feel like we made we made more, even more progress. We actually helped that woman, even though it took us a lot of saving to do it because the money she wanted was not there. Um, I feel like I made a lot of mistakes, but we still achieved lots of things. So that's really good. Uh, I wish you all a lovely rest of the week. Of course, I'll be back on Friday if you want to hang out during Outer Wilds. But if not, yeah, I, I hope you keep well. Goodbye, everyone.